Thank you, Eric. And then, Lord, our prayer is that in the reading and in reflecting, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. We, as we are different people, we are in different places uh, in our walk with you. And may, may the words of our, of our mouths, the meditation of our heart, be one that is pleasing to you is our prayer. Amen. Um, in this, I just call it a, a reflection. And in a way, I'm really passing on what I have learned not, not too long ago. Um, but I'd like to reflect on a, on a Christian practice, so to speak, that um, is probably overlooked quite a bit and uh, not given attention to that it needs to have. And it's the, the practice of biblical lament. Lament is not a word that is often used in a vocabulary, even in our everyday conversations. Lament. You know, we normally say, well, I'm grieving or I'm weeping, but I, you don't say I'm, lam, I'm in lament or I'm lamenting. Uh, and the word lament, if we just look at that only, it, it, it basically is, I mean, it's very simple. It's, it's an expression of grief, uh, pain, sorrow, anguish, just it's as simple as that. But lament in the scriptures uh, takes the expression, that expression of pain, and then starts talking to God about it. And, and today, as, as Eric has read from Psalm 77, we, we saw how that particular author talked about what he was going through. Um, and the reason why I, I, I'm sharing on it this morning is within the context, and this is not new for you, but we know that life is unpredictable. I mean, just give it a bit of time. <laughs> Life is really unpredictable. Um, characterized by twists and turns and the unexpected, the unfortunate. Uh, there, there are times, clearly, there are times of happiness, of joy, and then there's times of sorrow. Times of laughing, and then there's time, times of weeping. It sounds very much like Ecclesiastes, hey? A time, a time for everything. A season for every activity under the heavens. Um, but here's the question then. How, how do we, this is general, and then we can personalize it. How do we weep? I'm not necessarily talking about tears as well, but how do we grieve? How do we weep? Um, and then a question that perhaps maybe is a little bit on a deeper level is, what do we do with our pain and sorrow in life? Um, how do we talk to God about it? And perhaps the question is, can we talk to God about it? And the reason for that is that, depending on your age, depending on your church background, I, I grew up in a church community as a youngster where you, you keep quiet. When you come into church, you're quiet because that's a sign of respect. Things have changed. We come in, we have lots of fellowship. People are chatting. I think that's, that's, wonderful. that's wonderful as well. But normally reverence meant quiet. So if you really hit a tough time, what are we allowed? What, what are we meant to be doing? What do we do? This is very real. What do we do when we're angry <laughs> and when we're frustrated? And when we when we are unsure of what God is doing, what, what is he allowing to happen? And the questions that, that arises within us. Enter biblical lament. Lament allows us to express to God the, the messy parts of our lives. We, we learn how to ask God, Lord, we please do this, please do that. Are we quite comfortable with that? We learn to pray worshiping, we sing, we say, Lord, I love you, I praise you. But when we're angry and frustrated and we have questions, does that mean we just need to wait for this season to pass and then, okay, well, let's talk about it again to God? What do we do with our heartache when it comes into our lives every now and again, and sometimes the now and again are years apart? What perhaps makes it difficult is that often... Often life's hardships push us to become self-sufficient. Now, rely on our own strength, navigate, navigate ourselves the challenges that we face. 
Now, self-reliance, to an extent, is very beneficial. It can lead to a healthy, a healthy independence. But it can also bring us to an unhealthy independence. It, it may lead us to believe that we, you, know, you just need to, to carry the burdens alone. So, so we have expressions like, you know, just bite the bullet. <laughs> you know, just bear the brunt like, <laughs> I love this one, just take it on the chin. <laughs> take it on the chin and normally after that it doesn't get sad. Take it on the chin and just shut up. <laughs> just, just get through it, you know. I, I think when I look at the scriptures, I think true strength, true strength comes from from acknowledging our vulnerable moments. Uh, receiving help from God, receiving help from others, to, be, to make ourselves vulnerable to receive. The, the way of humility is asking God for help. And when we look at the scriptures, we, we read of the many individuals who cried out to God when they struggled. They, they would cry out to God from a place of deep pain and, and deep frustration that they were experiencing. And we find some of those in, individuals, not, not solely, but we find some of those individuals in the, in the book of Psalms. A third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Now, we don't read them in church. I, I've never heard them in church. I never did it myself. Read, read a song about, oh, whoa, and God, where are you? We, no, no, it's always praise the Lord and come together. And nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. When there's a funeral, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Very appropriate. But the place for a third of the Psalms don't seem to have place within our church services. It doesn't seem like it. The Psalms were, were songs. They were sung by individuals. They were, would be sung by the community. And, and, and they would be sung when, when the congregation is grieving. They would sing Psalm 77, where, what Eric has just read, where there's questions and where there's deep pain being expressed. They, 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 they composed those songs when they struggled with life, with God and life. Uh, struggle to, when they struggle to understand how God, just God's ways in all of this, we, it just doesn't make sense. And, and without reservation, they would express their disappointment to God. It was like an unfiltered honesty. Uh, and it can be clearly seen in, in, in what they prayed. And that included asking God questions like, God, where are you? Uh, if you love me, why is this happening to me? This is a classic one. What did I do to deserve this? I must have sinned somewhere along the line. Why is this happening to me? What did we, what did we do? And Psalm 77 is, is a psalm that is filled with that kind of honesty. It was written by a man by the name of Asaph. We don't know too much about him other than he had a, an important role in music and in poetry. And, and Asaph found himself in a tough situation. Uh, it all seemed so hopeless. It, it was as if he lost his way. So he starts by praying, by, by singing these words. I cry out to God. And then, and then he repeats himself, like for emphasis. I cried out to God. And that is where his lament starts. I cried out to God. We start by crying out to God. Crying out to God. Now, may I make a comment here? It takes faith to do that. It really does. It takes faith. When we experience deep pain and loss, sometimes the easier route is just to keep quiet. And perhaps we are in a place of just deep grieving. We don't have any words, and that's fine. Prayer, in that sense, can be silence. But when we get to the place where we can speak, but often people stop talking to God. We may be so disappointed. We may be so angry with God struggling with what we face and what we experience, 
Which is why prayers of lament are expressions of our faith in God. We talk to the one who, who can help. Perhaps not in the way that we want him to. <laughs> Ask Jesus, he knew that when in the garden he prayed. <laughs> not my will, but yours be done. But, but he, he, there was a communication, there was talking going on there. And it's especially appropriate to pray like this when we feel like God is far away. I don't know. Have you also been told, and you actually believe it, that God is everywhere? I really do. I believe it's just God is everywhere. Until I have a moment. (laughs) If you were really here, and so on and so on, In verse 2, after he cries out to God, and don't worry, I'm not going to go verse by verse and we sit here till 1 o'clock. Just just overview, really. In verse 2, we hear Asaph expressing more detail of his struggle. And he says, verse 2, In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. I'm so troubled, I cannot speak. Can I invite you just to step into an imaginary Asaph? And you see him sitting there, maybe like a Job with ashes on his head, and he's just in a really tough spot. And he's saying these words, I am so troubled, I cannot speak. Being, my comment, being so overcome with grief that one cannot speak reveals the depth of sorrow. He's at a loss for words. The the weight of his pain is so intense, it robs him of his ability to articulate the words that he's needed to express himself. As part of lament... Asaph then, this is the next portion one could say, he raises some questions about God. Now, pause for a moment. Do you think it's okay to ask God questions? Will the Lord reject us forever? That's the space that he's at. (laughs) Will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never again Give his blessing to me. Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Is it finished and clear, as they would say? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Is God not compassionate anymore? Had he had enough? These questions are probing ones. Where's God? What happened? What happened to him? He promised to be faithful. He promised to care. And my experience is that he's gone. So like Asaph, we we don't need to be shy or shy away rather from asking questions to God. Express them with an open heart. And we will not be the first ones to ask God what is happening. Can we ever forget Jesus on the cross crying out? What were those words? Are we familiar with them? My God, my God, why have you? Yeah, abandoned me. That's right. Forsaken. Have you left me? That was his experience, quoting Psalm 22. Where are you? Can we pause for a moment here and ask ourselves, can I talk to God about my pain? Then do I talk to God about my anguish, my suffering, my sadness? Is there anything that has caused me to stop talking to God? So he cries out to God, he asks God's questions. It, it, the, it seems that Asaph now takes another step as part of his prayers of lament. And once again, we listen in what he's praying. He's at a turning point. Verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. Verse 12. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Can you see a shift has taken place here? There's a shift, but here's my question. (laughs) How long was it before he made that shift? (laughs) 
We read Psalm 77 as, you know, when Eric did it, just one psalm, finish, he sits down. Was it maybe days between these two? Weeks, months? Was it perhaps years before he could write the psalm and it's all together now? We don't know. Sometimes we do need to take time and just be between the crying out to God and being angry with God, take some time until we're at a place again where we start to say, I'm going to remember the Lord again. <laughs> it doesn't mean we backslide. It doesn't mean we become terrible people. It's just I'm in a quiet space. I'm in a difficult space. Asaph makes a conscious decision to shift his focus from his current troubles to what God has done in the past. Just what I said about Lily, thinking about sunshine days and cupcakes that was there. That's at children's level. Uh, so we as adults, we, we think back, we think back. But focusing on what God has done in the past, and, and, and he says to God, God, you are unchanging. God, you are faithful. He's at a place where he can say that with an honest heart again. And then in verse 13, we see something else. He also now calls to mind who he knows God to be. Your ways, God, are holy. Holy means not only purity, but they are different than anybody else's ways. Uh, what God is as great, what God, small g, what God is as great as our God, capital G, he remembers who God is. It's, it's like he reminds himself why he can trust God in those circumstances and why he should persevere in trusting God. I think we may just learn from Asaph here to, to hold on and remind ourselves who God is and that we can trust him and trust that the promises he made are true and he'll be faithful to them. Promises such as can you think of some? Can you finish this? I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Nothing in all creation will separate me from his love. Romans 8. And from this point on, Asaph really has turned the corner. And it's, it's not necessarily that his circumstances have changed. You know, everything needs to be better before I can now just worship again. I, he may be in the same spot still, but his lament, his pouring his heart out to God, has brought a change, a change of perspective. Verse 14, you are the God who works wonders. You who have made known your might among the peoples. And he reaffirms his faith in God. And by doing so, everyone, it's like he, uh, it's like he anchors himself again. It's choppy all around, storms, wind, dark, but he's anchored himself again. He has reason to hope. God will see me through. God will make a way. In the, in the last few verses of this psalm, verses 15 to 18, Asaph continues his journey of remembering, but he's become very focused now on an event in the past. The Exodus. The Exodus is in Israel's history. It still is today. They will celebrate the Passover, whether they're secular Jews or religious Jews. It will be, the Passover will be celebrated. Those miraculous events that happened and how they could and why they left Egypt. In verse 15, he recalls the parting of the Red Sea. The Hebrew people followed in God's footsteps, who leads them like a, like a shepherd leads his flock. Verse 16, he emphasizes God's sovereignty over nature, stating that the waters of the sea saw God and squirmed in response. It's metaphorical, but it just says that God is so much stronger. Verse 17, he reflects on God's saving acts in redeeming his people. Verse 18, he recalls the miraculous guidance of the Israelites, symbolized by the pillar of cloud, God. The pillar of cloud by day, God's presence. The pillar of fire by night, God's presence during the dark times. He, calls, he recalls to mind God's constant presence 
and God's faithful guidance throughout their journey. That is what this psalm is about. Now, that last part. As Christians, on September 15, 2024, at Nice Presbyterian Church, I invite you to fast forward from that time through the corridors of, corridors of time as we come to a hill outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Another exodus moment unfolds, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And at the cross, at the cross, sin's power is broken, death and evil is conquered, and a new covenant is established. Jesus offers redemption, offers reconciliation to all who believe. The cross is a symbol of hope, of victory. Darkness defeated, the light, the light shines anew. So in our lament, everyone, as we pour our hearts to God, we can also turn to the cross. Re we remember how Jesus gave his all. He who did not spare his own son, Paul writes to the Romans, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? May the cross remain just a, a symbol, a life event that continues to transform our lives and that anchors us in the storms. Asaph's journey in, in Psalm 77 led him to a deeper trust in God's faithfulness. And so too, our journey to the cross lead, can lead to a deeper understanding of God's love and of God's grace. Here's what is similar. In both cases, remembrance played a crucial role in shaping faith. And it does so in the midst of turmoil and pain. And so we talk to God. We remind ourselves that God is faithful. Appropriately, without me asking, a song was selected for our closing song. It's the song, He Will Hold Me Fast. Just so appropriate. I could never, never keep my hold. We don't. <laughs> Through life's fearful paths at times, he will hold me fast. But before we sing that, can we just have a few moments of silence, if you're comfortable to close your eyes, and just to focus and say, Lord, what, what have you said to me? What are you saying to me? Something I need to learn, something I need to take note of. Or is this for another time? And so our prayer is simply, Lord, anchor us. Anchor us and help us to believe that you hold each one of us fast. Amen.